Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm really excited about this this webinar because we're going to talk about the mobile salesperson. And you might say, well, salespeople have always been mobile, whether they've been going door to door or hopping on planes, trains, automobiles. Uh, but I think it's getting even more complicated in the world we live in today. And that's what we want to talk about. So, you know, you're used to going from prospect to prospect, customer to customer, perpetual motion. Um, so how do you stay organized in this crazy uh, world that we live in today of instant communication, of buyers that are harder to get in contact with, etc.? So we're going to discuss that today. And I have a fantastic panel who's going to discuss it. And I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves rather than me um, read out their bios. I think it's much more interesting to hear from them. So first, uh, Janvi Johori, if you'd like to introduce yourself to our webinar guest today. Certainly. Namaste. I am from India. And I believe that sales can be a way to bridge gaps around communities and cultures. I strongly am of the opinion that sales should come from the heart and not from trends and technologies alone. And uh, essentially that the human factor is as important as tapping man-machine synergies. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, so greetings, greetings to India from all of us. And, um, and then we have another country represented here because Jim, uh, Jim Pancero is in the People's Republic of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're not talking to anybody. <laughs> it's the <laughs> Texas way. <laughs> well, yeah, I am Jim Pansero. I'm a sales and sales leadership consultant and trainer. And I have been doing a consulting and training for about 38 years and watching the sales evolution change. I tend to work mostly in distribution equipment sales with just a little bit of services, uh, all focused on the structures and processes of how you gain a competitive advantage and how you increase your effectiveness. Excellent. And last but not least, we have Kenny Weiss, who is in Arizona. How are you doing, Kenny? Doing really well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm a life coach, a speaker, an author, and I founded something called the Greatness Movement. It's uh, really the next step in personal development. Most of my clients or people that follow my stuff, they've been to the typical thought leaders. And I discovered a cycle, a thing that keeps us all from the success we want that I wrote about in my book. And um, it just goes much deeper than what's out there. Yeah, fantastic. And and Kenny wins the best dressed award for the from the men here today. Anyway, putting putting Jim and I to shame. Look at that. We look fantastic. All right. So let's get let's get straight into this. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today. Okay. So. When we talk about mobile salespeople, so we have this classic stereotype, well, one of them of the salesperson, you know, the one rushing through the airport, phone under chin, uh, laptop open, typing everything, trying to drag a suitcase, trying to check in at the same time, and uh, and maybe even eat a sandwich at the, uh, while they're doing all of this. And But the reality is that the top salespeople, the truly the top performers, uh, they tend to be a lot more organized, calm, and efficient in what they do. So how, in your experience, how do top salespeople achieve this level of organization and calm that seems to escape a lot of others? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, Kenny, you want to start with this one? Well, I approach all of this from a much different angle than the typical, I guess, you know, sales platform. Mm -hmm. When I look at someone's life who's out of whack like that, so disorganized, that tells me what's going on with them emotionally. Someone who has their thing, because well, the first thing is most people don't realize everything we do is emotion-based, not thought-based. And mm -hmm. so if your life's in disarray, something's going on internally. So someone who's more calm with that, you know, and more regimented or more scheduled, that tells me they're generally more at peace inside. So the person who's really struggling to uh, keep their schedule on all of that, there's disarray everywhere. And that's probably showing up in their ability to sell and, and work with their clients and provide the services. John Bay, you know, uh, said so eloquently, you can't connect from a place of heart if your life's in disarray. And so how would you be able to really connect with your clients? Yeah, that's a that's a that's an excellent point. And and uh, switching over, John B. What uh, the, the same uh, the same question? Like, how do you how do top performing salespeople how do they have that level of calm and organization that seems to escape a lot of others? 
I think it comes from a lot of experience. It comes from a lot of understanding of human nature. Essentially, they are able to build trust, hold conversations, foster meaningful change, and build a shared vision. This is the focus of a mobile salesperson. This is the focus of the salesperson of the future. And this is the focus of the salesperson who can sell with his heart and with his soul. Yeah, so, so basically, I mean, if you're rushing around and you're in complete disarray, everything is pretty much out of alignment, right, at that stage? Yes. Yeah. And, and Jim, from, from your years of experience, uh, tell me, what, 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 uh, how does a top salesperson just have that level of calm that other people don't? Well, there's two different sides or ways to approach that. The what, first is uh, talking about the emotions and your self-esteem and your confidence and your comfort and uh, those issues. But I have found that doesn't necessarily have the major impact on the top performers because today systems and processes have gone through such dramatic changes. I see a lot of salespeople that have a really positive attitude and all the other energy, but they're still not doing it because there's none of the other tools in place. The reality of the day is for, for a top salesperson to be a top salesperson, they got to have three components. They've got to have strong messaging that's brief of saying, this is what I want to talk to you about because we don't have a half hour to explain ourselves anymore. They've got to have strong tools and structures of what are the steps and processes and how they control information. Because if, if I don't have a strong CRM system and I don't have a strong discipline to record this kind of information on a regular basis and then know how to use it, I'm probably not going to be as effective as I could. And the third part is today, this is no longer the uh, independent gunfighter environment of selling. Mm -hmm. It's really much more of who's your coach and who's your strategist and who's the one helping you see. Because the most, salespeople, most successful salespeople I see that are calm, have a proactive plan in place, know what they're doing, and they see that it's working. Yeah, I think those are those are great points, Jim. And I think that is one of the one of the most overlooked one is is the planning and the preparation and all of that. Because the guy, uh, the people you see running around crazy, everything in in disarray, you can normally trace it back to the fact that they didn't put aside planning time, they didn't get themselves organized in advance. So here's another here's here's another question that I want to pose uh, pose to you. Maybe Tanvi, uh, we can start with you. And we were actually talking about this before we came on air. So salespeople today can operate from just about anywhere. We've all got we've all got our smartphones. We've got internet access pretty much yeah, anywhere we want. And um, a lot of buyers actually don't want salespeople to come and visit them anymore they're quite happy to do virtual meetings they're quite happy to to connect in in digital ways so how does a salesperson still get a good connection with a, a prospect or a customer even when they don't get to see them physically where maybe virtually it may be through digital uh, connection Face-to-face -face dialogue is no longer important in a mobile-first world. Essentially, we have come to a stage where the mobile salesperson can manage just fine without meeting the client face-to-face. -face. Essentially, you have to just remember that you're building a rapport with the client, with the customer, with the prospect, and you have to see the person as a human being and not a dollar sign. So it is essentially focusing on relationship building, focusing on building trust, and creating a sales cycle that works for the customer as much as it does for the salesperson. So, how to tell me? So that so for a lot of uh, salespeople who've been you know selling for a long time, they've grown up in a face-to-face -face world, and now when you put a computer or a device between them and the, the prospect or customer, they struggle a little bit. The struggle is part of understanding how to cope with new technologies, but you have to also see the positive side, which is that essentially you're getting instantaneous communication, spanning continents, spanning cultures, spanning languages. So essentially technology is the biggest enabler here if the mobile salesperson knows how to use it to his advantage. Yeah, great. And, and Jim, you were saying just before we came on air about, about a fantastic customer of yours who loves everything you do, who buys lots of, of the things that you provide, but doesn't want you to call them. How bizarre is that? Well, well I, one of the things I watch happen in selling 
is the selling process and the challenges to a sales rep really haven't changed in one regard. And that is they've had both the responsibility of dealing with all of the information coming into them, as well as all the information they have to maintain. Now, if we go back 30 years ago, that was probably one one hundredth of the information that was in play back then as it was today. So you could get by with five by seven cards to keep track of your customers with rubber bands around them with stacks of ABCs or prospects. Today, we're, they're every both sides are overwhelmed with what's happening. This is where differentiation comes in because um, in, in your flexibility of what you do as a salesperson to how you get your messaging across. The reality is the internet has really screwed up our lives as salespeople because the customers now, the uh, a study was done and the number one choice of baby boomers is if they wanna buy something new is they went to a salesperson. It was the number seventh choice of millennials. The number one choice of millennials was to ask their friends. Number two was to Google it. So the problem we have today is this assumption of the buyer that they don't really need a salesperson and frankly don't like them so that they will do as much as they can to move their buying process without the salesperson being present, really only bringing them in as an order taker. So this role we have of our communications and all the different media we use, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's a website, whether it's mailings or anything else, is working to try to say, get us involved earlier and let us be part of that process. And some of my retail customers, 50% of the people coming into buying a riding lawnmower in the spring bring a printout in, and they've already decided what features they want and what they think they're going to pay for it. And half of those people have dramatically underconfigured the size equipment they need. They're going to make a wrong decision. This is forcing salespeople to be more proactive and have more of structure of what they do to take back this control so they can get a, a competitive uh, win within these situations. Yeah, and obviously that puts a lot more pressure on uh, building trust because if you do, if you feel as a customer that you're well informed, and then you come to a salesperson and, as you say, maybe you have underconfigured something, um, you need to trust that the, the that the salesperson is your best interest at heart and isn't just trying to upset you. Uh, yeah, and trust is not something that you do. Yeah. Trust is a result of what you've done. Mm -hmm. So part of this is how you position, how you communicate, even how you set up. Yeah. And uh, and Kenny, so uh, again, living in this virtual world where people are using, uh, yes, they're using communications tools to be able to communicate um, very efficiently, effectively and fast, but they're also using it as a way of separating themselves and putting up barriers. So how can, how can salespeople still build rapport and connection, even if they're not seeing people face to face, if it's virtual or it's through digital means? Jim's first answer it was great it, because second one was that, no 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 it, <laughs> it, there's a certain point i want to draw on it, it's not that your second answer was off but the c clear communication you know, you outlined three steps well since everything's email and everything's um uh text message and stuff too many words if they don't know what you're doing like people they, they'll read they'll read about the first sentence if you don't get them you're done Mm -hmm. And so I get inundated on LinkedIn with people wanting to sell to me. First of all, I can't stand it. That's what we talked about. I mean, you have that great client who just doesn't want to hear from you because we are so inundated with everybody selling us. Nobody wants another email telling you about how great they are and how they're going to fix all this stuff. You, you don't even know me. You mm -hmm. don't know what my problem is yet. You're going off for this half a page of how great you are and how you're going to fix these problems. Why don't you start with a question? Like that's what boggles my mind is all these sales CRM things are about, we're going to lay out this problem. We haven't even talked to you. You're a cold lead. And we're going to lay out everything about us. We've never even asked you what you want. You talk about trust. Well, here's the thing people misunderstand about trust. Trust is never earned. It's always given. Think about it. Mm -hmm. The first time you meet somebody, you go to a random event, you sit next to somebody. For some reason, the, this person next to you on a Tuesday, you decided to share your life story with. You went to an event that afternoon, the guy next to you, you decided not to share anything. Intrinsically, we will feel comfortable next to certain people or with certain situations. 
we give our trust and then we wait and see what the response is or what we get back. And then the trust is earned. But in sales, everyone has that process backwards. And so what I've seen, the biggest mistake is everybody's inundating people with so much information. And like you said, your clients, they love you, but they know so much about you. They don't want to know anymore. So the question becomes, what do they want? And that's why I was like, I had a great email from a guy from LinkedIn, total sales guy, but he just asked me a really deep thought provoking question. We ended up trading emails, having a great conversation. He never once mentioned sales, but if he ever writes me again, I'll respond to him because he wasn't trying to take from me. He wasn't trying to get me to do something to make his life better. And that's what the internet, all this connection, it's created a disconnect. We all are emotionally overwhelmed by everybody coming at us. We can't deal with it. We don't have the skills and tools emotionally, so we push it all away. And so to me, the biggest shift is you want to become a better salesperson. You need to understand that that old way doesn't work. People will only, as John B. said, you have to connect emotionally. But the way people do it, they're still using the old techniques. You, you have to switch the way you're going about it. By the way, uh, this has been in place for 50 years. Yeah, because if we go back in the old days, the receptionist in the lobby was the screener to be able to screen the calls of the person coming in. And that then the and 30 years ago, the major conversation is how do you get around the receptionist? People but, were but calling at eight o'clock in the morning here's because the of that just to get around them. So yeah. then it moved to they were, you know, the emails and then all these other things. But the, Jim, here's the, the difference. Resistance, well, just a second. The, the resistance has always been there. This is not a new problem the solutions of how we solve it because of the uniqueness of the technologies we're dealing with are going to be there. But this is, we got to be careful. This is not a new problem. This I has will. been in sales since the, since the beginning. See, and I disagree. It's a completely different problem. Only 7% of all communication is words. 93% is tone and body language. When you walked into that reception, she either felt comfortable with you or she didn't because we make those decisions based on feeling. Well, now we are using the least effective mode of communication to drive sales. If you can't connect emotionally, you're done. And that's the big difference is, yes, you used to walk in and people could decide, just like the example I gave sitting at a random event, you either felt comfortable or you didn't. In an email, you can't feel that. And if you use a word in a certain phrase, and if here's the other thing, what people don't realize is when they get your email or your, their text, what just happened in their life in that moment? If they're in a bad mood and you have a phrase in a certain way, they're going to project their own internal turmoil onto that email. It has nothing to do with what you said, but people are so careless with their words, they don't realize how they trigger people. And so that's why I'm saying <clears throat> your communication style, when you use words, has to be incredibly precise because it's the least, for, at least effective way to communicate with people. And that's been proven for centuries. So that's why I'm saying it's a completely different environment. The basic concept of trying to break through somebody, but you're going at it from a completely different profile than you, we ever have. Yeah, you're and agreeing just, with what I'm saying, though. Yeah. I'm agreeing that yes, we have, to get, I, we have to get past the gatekeeper. What I'm disagreeing with is that the process is the same. It's not. because the challenge was the same. It, I, I, and I'd say yes, but the challenge is different because we don't have that emotional connection. It's a different problem. That's Maybe we're arguing over semantics, but... <laughs> Person. No, it's a it's, it's a because good, we're from different countries. It's a good conversation, <laughs> um, and and John V, um, why don't you weigh in on this? Um, how do you create, uh, as I said, uh, with with digital? How do how do you create this connection? Because here's here, here's the. Uh, an issue that I have that really drives me mad, and, and I think Kenny, you're you're relate to this. Is you're saying, yes, you know, email or you know, LinkedIn. Whatever. I, I hate people starting off with, hey, John, hey, how's it going? It's like, I don't know you. Why are you saying hey to me? How, um, and addressing me like I'm your long lost best buddy, right? Um, this, this just, and I know what you're doing, and it actually irritates me as opposed to makes me more comfortable. And my mother always said, hey is for horses anyway. So, 
Um, but so, so John V, how do you ensure that you create a good connection through when you're writing emails or you're, or you're using digital means so that you don't actually irritate the other person as opposed to actually, you know, make them feel like maybe this is somebody I want to hear from? Well, you have to play an active role in understanding where they come from. You have to understand that you have to meet the customer where he or she is, not where you want them to be. Essentially, you have to focus on how you're going to do that. And for that, you need to be able to communicate in a way that appeals to them and in a way that understands them as well. So it's a two-way communication that can happen. As uh, Kenny was saying, we don't have the advantage of proxemics, kinesics, body language, but we do have the advantage of instant connectivity. And we can use it to our benefit if we are able to build trust based on not earning it, but rather getting it from the person on the basis of a deeper understanding of where he or she is at that point in time, rather than you know, building it on a, a stereotype of a typical sales process where you have a, a particular order, a deal, which has to be clinched, discounts, takeaways, all of that. So you have to basically understand the customer before you begin to understand how he or she will give you their trust. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. And, and just following on, we, we live in this casual culture today, unfortunately, and I think that there's, if there's one takeaway, this is my suggestion to people, you can take it or leave it. You will never get dinged for being polite and to being respectful in how you approach someone. So again, if you're if you're communicating through LinkedIn or email, think about it. If you burst through Kenny's door and just went, hey, Kenny, it's me. Look what I've got for you. Kenny called security, right? And he'd be right to. Um, so why do you do it in digital communications? Why don't you approach people in a respectful, polite way and figure out is if this is... Uh, as I said, I mean, if there's if there's some value you can bring to them. Um, OK, so so moving on, uh, Jim, uh, we have tools like mobile CRM. We have a mobile CRM app for for pipeline and a CRM. And we believe that when used properly now, these mobile um, CRM and these mobile tools can really help you as you move around. But you have to understand the value of them as opposed to uh, you know, thinking of them as a tool that's imposed by somebody or, you know, sticking with maybe more traditional forms of keeping yourself organized. How, how do you encourage people to leverage and adapt and adopt tools to help them be more nimble in the field? I think one of the I've been involved with the CRM system since the first one came out. Uh, Telemagic in 1982, when the first one came out, just about the time the PCs came out. So and you were using this one when you were in elementary school, is it? Oh, no, I was. <laughs> I, I think I've lapped everybody on in this thing. It's one of the joys is uh, being old. Um, but when, one of the things I watch happen with this is that it, this is a reality of how sales have changed. If we go back 10 years ago, the whole success of a salesperson was based on their personal ability to project and communicate and to build trust and all the other values that are being talked about. And marketing was really a secondary thing. Marketing only meant we'll give you a couple brochures to support your sales call as you go banging on doors. Today, the process is flipped completely. And no matter what your job is of selling, all of this trust and everything else is no longer developed on the first call with the handshake, how I walk in the lobby, as has been mentioned. It's now based on the marketing and setup. So it's like, what are you posting on LinkedIn? And what are you posting on these sites and participating in webinars and doing all this other stuff so that you, you build a connection with the person, even though you haven't connected with them, they've connected wow. with you by watching this to lead in. So the reality is I just used to pick up the phone and make sales calls to sell my consulting service 10 or 20 years ago. Today, I'm posting four videos a week on LinkedIn. I have a newsletter that goes out. I'm, tr I'm marketing a free a newsletter to associations, all with this idea of having that first connection to build that trust, to build that communications, so we can then have the conversation. Now, you also, I think, have to define, are we talking about retail sales, where I'm selling to you as an individual? Uh, or are we talking about we're business? Talking, we're talking B2B generally. Yeah, because th th that also is a difference in how that's established, how that trust is communicated, and the things that are done as part of that. 
it's, I think that the challenge for salespeople is the job has just gotten 10 times more complex because now they really have to have a marketing plan in place. They can't just have the steps of a sales call plan in place mm-hmm. to be effective and successful. Yeah, and and Jamfi, how how would you uh, recommend that people leverage tools while they're in the field and and leverage them effectively to make themselves you know better and connect better and understand their customers better? Well, you have to look at the numbers first. There are two point eight million Android apps and two point two million iOS apps in iStores right now. So if you look at the situation, you have a you have a set sense of understanding of how people are spending hours on their smartphone, how clients are reverting to mobile first technologies and platforms for associating with the sales process and how you can make uh, the sales cycle shorter and customer retention longer if you were able to tap into mobile CRM because it promotes quick management, deeper connections and a broader understanding of what the customer wants and how you can give it to them. You're essentially more responsive to the customer and you're able to meet the needs and be able to understand their requirements way better. Yeah, and and I think that's a very good point about the fact that you can be more responsive and you can be more informed uh, when you're dealing with the customer as opposed to having to run back to your, your PC or flick through your notes. Um, Kenny, how do, you, how do you advise people to use technology you know, to better connect with their customers? Well, what I've seen is kind of the sales process in reverse. Is, mm-hmm. As Jim said, people go in, they have spec sheets. They've really, instead of us selling them, they research us. They do all their due diligence or they just Google everything. And, mm-hmm. and it's very rare that it used to be, I'm going to go to you, the expert, you're going to educate me. And then from there, I'll make a decision. Well, now most people become their own expert and then they look for someone they like that meets that. And so that's why the LinkedIn bombing stuff doesn't work. <laughs> and, um, so like my solution has been my whole life story is all across the internet, YouTube channel, everything. Because what I have found, especially in my line of work, which is deeper personal work, is somebody's gonna look and they need to to make a judgment, basically. Do I like this person or not? And if they don't, they'll move on to somebody else. But people will lay in the weeds. They'll research you out first. And so the more your communication can, well, I don't know, direct you, I wouldn't say direct communication, but the more available people can learn about you, so they because they need they will search out if they trust you, versus the other way around. And so, from my experience, it's been that if if people can see, as you know, Jim said, he's posting four videos a week. People are watching those. They're listening to his content. They're like, "Wow, do I like that or not?" Then they're coming to him more often than not with the sales process. So I, I think. That's one of the things you have to do. So when you use a CRM or something, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk likes to do the whole, you know, are you giving value? Um, you know, that's one way of explaining it. So, but it's less about um, how can I teach you versus how can you learn about me and then build that comfort so they'll come to you. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Okay, so here's another challenge uh, that I want to talk about. Maybe, uh, you know, start with... Uh, with, with John V on this one is, okay, so there's a downside of having all of and these communication tools, right? So we have LinkedIn, we have social media, you can direct message through social media, we have text messaging, we have good old fashioned, which is funny to say now, good old fashioned email. Um, we have that, uh, that crazy thing, you know, that actual phone where you can actually talk to people back and forth. Um, send a fax. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. send a fax. But the actual calling people on the phone, it's something that my 14-year-old son thinks is just a, a crazy an, anachronism from the last century. Like, why would you ever call somebody? But the thing is, so we, but my point is, we have all of these different ways of communicating. How do you choose which is the best way to communicate with your particular prospect or buyer? Because I find sometimes people will, they will choose how to communicate with me as opposed to me um, telling them or, you know, letting them know how I would like to be communicated with. 
Well, letting the prospect take the lead always works because people always like being right. But mostly people like to buy from people they can relate to and like to. So you have to gauge the channel that works for the customer. And for this, I would say go with the numbers, analytics, measurable indicators. How do you understand where the customer is on the basis of numbers? And then you can essentially meet them where they are and proceed with the entire process in a way that is meaningful, relevant, and incisive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and um, and Jim, have you ever had the experience, uh, you know, that I've had many times? Is you fill out a form and it says, "How would you like to be contacted?" and you say, you know, you click the email, and because the form took your phone number and all of that, what happens? They phone you, and you're like, "What? I just said I wanted to be communicated." So, how do you? How do you? figure out the best way of communicating with prospects and how they want to be communicated with? Well, the traditional concept is an old selling term called mirroring. Um, I just am amazed. I'll be writing with a sales rep doing research on a company I'm working with. This just happened last week. And as we're at lunch, the sales rep mentioned, oh, I, and they, got, they described they got this text from a customer asking a question about availability of a product or some kind of question like that. Sales rep picked up the phone and called him back. And I, after he hung up, I said, you know, that was very insulting what you just did. Because I said, you're not respecting the channel the customer is presenting. I think what it says for us as a salespeople is it's kind of like fishing. We just got to throw out more nets. So uh, you, you stay and you dabble in these different technologies so that people know that you're there at least present. So that then when they respond, you can then jump to communicate and choose which channel is going to best fit what you do. So a lot of times reaching out to them by multiple channels is even more effective in the kind of results that are generated. I think the idea that we have to have here is that there is a flexibility required to be successful in sales today because of what the customer's expectations are. And the expectations are different because baby boomers still want to be called. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a very good point, and in fact, they make a make a they'll make a point of that if you don't communicate. So, so Kenny, um, same question for you. How do you figure out the best way to communicate with people? Uh, honestly, it's a crapshoot again because you, you're not more often than not you're not having that face to face interaction. So your gut instinct is taken out of it. And so, yeah, I agree. The, try all of them. You know, you, you, you have to cast a wide net and see what works for them. And then, yeah, honor the way that works for them. You know, you, you, you have to try and get as much information on the person as possible. Look at their Facebook page. Look at their LinkedIn. See what kind of lifestyle they live. What, what can you glean from that as to what type of person they might be? In other words, what you're trying to do is digitally figure out that process that we used to have when we'd walk in mm -hmm. and you'd get a feel for somebody. So the more research you can do on their lifestyle as a person could give you openings into that. But in general, yes, you're, you're flying blind. And so you have to be willing to try every different avenue. And, and you see a lot of people go, well, no, everybody wants this. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not everybody does. And since we don't have that face-to-face -face interaction or rarely anymore you're, you're kind of just throwing darts till you see which one they respond to yeah and and i and i like that uh, i like that concept of what uh, of what jim said about mirroring because you know if somebody texts you good idea probably to text back and you could i mean jim in the text you could easily say here's some of the information would you like me to call you to explain it further and then they can give you permission uh, if, if we look at the something really fundamental, but if we look at the steps of a sales call, the final step in the selling process is in the steps of the sales call is not to ask for the order. It's not to close. It's agreeing and setting up your next contact mm -hmm. so that I don't care if you say no in our conversation, as long as I have a chance to keep talking. Yes. So one of the goals of all of these other technologies of communications like texting is really to not close, not to sell something but it's to generate the next conversation that hopefully will be more in depth so that you can do more of your job. So to me, it's, it's really back to as simple as the fundamental steps of a sales call of lowering resistance, asking questions, presenting, closing, but then most critically setting up and positioning. So to me, it's not trying to get my message across in that text message as much as it is trying to ask a question or generate needs so they wanna talk further, which is also the same goal when you work a trade show. 
you're not trying to sell something to the trade show. You're trying to get a follow-up conversation to really delve down and be able to help them. Yeah, exactly. Or you're just trying to uh, figure out how do you get rid of this back pain after three days of standing at your booth, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. When when somebody forgot to uh, order the the rubber that goes under the carpet, you know, you ever had that one? That if you don't have that extra padding there, yeah. <laughs> Some, um, okay. So in the last part of the of the panel discussion here, we'd like to end with the with a more open ended question. Um, and maybe Janvi, if you want to start on this, is what do you think Certainly. your salesperson will look like? The salesperson of the future, well, uh, he will be someone who will be data driven because the best way to understand your customer is to use the data that he or she is presenting you, along with, of course, the wealth of experience, the wealth of insights and the wealth of knowledge that you have accumulated in your practice as a salesperson. Essentially, this means that the salesperson of the future will be a strategic specialist. He or she will be oriented towards working with customers at a point where the customers are rather than at a point where he or she wants them to be. Yeah, so when you say when you say that in in you're basically saying that they're the salesperson of the future is going to have to be more probably more highly skilled, more knowledgeable about business and the business of business and the business of their clients, right? Essentially, they'll have to understand the client, but they'll also have to understand the technologies because new CRM systems are coming up, new methods of understanding and relating to customers are coming up. And if you don't catch on to the technology, you stay behind. So it's essentially the case where you can become extinct as a salesperson if you don't keep up with future technologies and future trends as much as you do with understanding what the customer wants. Yeah, no, great points. Um, because uh, nobody nobody wants to be extinct, uh, right, Kenny? So, what do you think the future salesperson looks like? I couldn't agree with her more. I mean, obviously, you, the the world is moving away from interpersonal dynamics, and you know, I think that's that's really a, a solution for somebody to find is how do you bring an interpersonal dynamic into a growing um distancing of interpersonal i mean a lot of people are just literally afraid to pick up the phone they're afraid to meet in person we have become so segregated and so used to really a lack of connection um that's a skill set that i'd love to do some research on to be able to you know because we look we all know sales is an emotional you know we buy on emotion we buy if we like somebody or something like that that's how all sales is well without that interpersonal connection that's a very difficult process so to me that's you want to be the person who exceeds um that's really the sixty four thousand dollar question is how do you create that new emotional connection in a system that is devout of it um i think that's really the answer yeah and i think an, an interesting part of that too kenny is the fact that uh, because people sit behind devices and because there is not that human connection, people, you know, can be a lot more abrupt and rude. And oh. um, I mean, I had an experience, I had an experience recently uh, myself where I was just blown away by the way somebody acted. I knew they would never do that to my face, but. It, it so. is now, that's the thing with email, text, all of it. It is now socially acceptable to be completely rude and not finish a convert, just leave it. If, if there's any sort of discomfort, they just, you know, they call, I think the kids call it ghosting. Um, and, and that's okay, or not reply to an email. There's no longer that, di you know, communication. I can leave it at any time and never respond. And if you get upset, you're the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yes. So there's this, this built-in denial system what is really what we've done is because we get so stressed out, we don't have any skills to deal with that. We've created a built in denial system where I don't have to take accountability for myself. And if you ever challenge me on it, you're the problem, not me. So like I said, that's an emotional situation. And that's really what, you know, the next, you know, the, the as we get into sales in the future, that's the biggest bridge to gap is how do you, overcome that 
Yeah, no, I, I love the way you, you you hit the nail on the head there. And I love that today about the fact that everybody ha has given themselves this get out of jail card. Uh, yeah, this has become uncomfortable. Uh, so I'm out of here. You're upset. It's your problem. Uh, I, why are you getting upset? Uh, I, I, I should never have to deal with yeah, anything. I, I, I have no responsibility. Yeah, I should never have to be accountable. Yeah. Why would I? Exactly. And how dare you <laughs> expect me to be kind and, and respectful? Like, that's just an unreasonable expectation. Exactly. So, Jim, salesperson of the future, what do you think he or she will look like? Well, we're seeing a lot of other industry changes that are, we're kind of showing what this is looking like. A good example is the NFL and football quarterbacks don't call the plays anymore from the field. The offensive coordinator does up in the stands talking by a microphone to a speaker in the helmet. It's not because the quarterbacks are dumber. It's because the game has gotten more complex and the competition has gotten harder. I think that the reality of the salesperson of the future is not going to be this independent gunfighter, the real high hustler uh, that is the real persuasive, all of the stereotypes that people frankly hate of salespeople is not part of that. It's much more of a SWAT team kind of basis where the strength of the salesperson is not as much based on their individual performance skills themselves of their persuasion or something. It's what the team and the whole process that's being done and given is going to be. Uh, it's forcing salespeople. I mean, it's, it's like in distribution. Every, the big fight in distribution today of delivery is in what they call the final mile. How do we get it from the warehouse to your home, the Amazon model? It's that final mile. Well, if we look into the future, we might not be able to describe what that final mile is going to look like because of how technology changes, but there's still going to be that salesperson in that final mile part of the selling process with a company responsible for the flexibility and the communications to be able to reach the customer to show them why you have a better solution, why you are lower risk, will make their life easier, will increase their profitability or change their competitive advantage. So as part of this process, the difference is going to be how the sales rep becomes more proactive, even with all the restraints. The reality is a CRM system is invisible to a customer. Mm -hmm. So me having a CRM system will allow me to be better controlling my information, but it's going to be invisible to the customer because, I mean, they're not going to say what CRM system yeah, are you exactly. going to buy from me. If we look, the issue is going to be how the sales rep becomes more proactive and under a process, thinking more moves ahead, most salespeople are like the Hilari bird. Ever hear the Hilari bird? It's a three-foot bird, lives in four-foot grass, spends its whole life saying, where the hell are we? That's <laughs> really one move ahead. Every sales rep follows a three-step selling process of show up, suck up, and pucker up. So, I mean, it's just like, what do you need? How, the average salesperson goes into a customer and says, anything you need, anything coming up, anything I can help with, and how's the family, and determines that reactive process to be a sales call. So if we look at what that future is going to look like, it's going to be more on purpose with a stronger messaging, stronger step structures of ID to close of what their plans are to take this customer through this journey, and with more active coaching to make sure we are gaining the competitive edge. Because it doesn't matter what happens to technology, it's still a relative competitive process of what I can do versus anybody else to show you, all, and the things that are being said, more value, lower risk ease of use, any of those other kind of components. So that if we look at that selling process moving forward, it's actually becoming more of a marketing included structure more than this independent gunfighter sales rep structure. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a it's a team approach and, and you definitely need to be more informed, both data driven and understanding yourself. I mean, I think salespeople in the future are going to need to have much higher levels of business acumen they're going to understand the business of business and the business of their buyer. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to have those high value, intelligent conversations. So yeah, they've is, needed that for the last 30 yeah. years, though. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. What you just said, all valid, but it's been that way. 30 years ago, they were saying that yeah. because of that, you focused on the customer and everything else. Now, the question is, how do you break through the crust when your mm -hmm. competitors can't? Yeah, no, 100%. As I said, it's going to get harder and harder. So listen, this has been a fascinating panel discussion. I mean, we've gone, we, we've covered such an amount of ground today. It's been fantastic and having a great diverse range of opinions. But before we go, I'd just like each of you to 
just tell the audience how they can find out a little bit more about you and, and contact you. Um, this panel discussion, I want to thank all the attendees who attended today. This will also be up on the site. So we tend to have a lot of people come and view these. They're very, very popular with our audience. So first, um, Jamvi, how can people find out more about you? Go to my LinkedIn page, go to my Twitter page, and of course, go to my sales pop contributory section where you can read all the articles that I have written so far. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And Kenny, it's uh, go to your LinkedIn and bombard you with an email selling you something, yeah, correct? Please, right. Yes, yeah, I'll be <laughs> long. Yeah, and start it off with the friend request with the sales pitch in it. That's yeah. even better. <laughs> Um, just Google my name, Kenny Weiss. My YouTube channel with all my podcasts, will come, everything will come up there, the reviews, all the different things. And then my website, uh, www.thegreatnessmovement.com if you want you know, information on all the different things I'm doing. Fantastic. And Jim? Well, I've got um, three off uh, offers. The first is uh, connect with me on LinkedIn because I am posting four videos a week on sales and sales leadership. But the second is if you go to my website, pancero.com, you can sign up for my free newsletter that comes out weekly that includes all the links for the videos that I've posted as an easier way to access what I'm doing. I also have another website that's called advancedsalesuniversity.com, where there is a number of video training programs that salespeople and their managers can work through to help them increase their competitive advantage. And most important, if I can answer any questions, Reach out and call me with whatever technology you want. I'll respond in kind. Excellent. So I'm preparing my carrier pigeon as, as we speak. I'm just going <laughs> to write the note in small enough writing and send it to you. All right. Well, listen, uh, listen, Jamvi, Kenny, Jim, this has been a fantastic discussion. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Thank you to those who attended today. And thank you for everybody who's going to watch the recording. And please share this with, uh, with other like-minded people. As I said, these panel discussions are very popular because it's great to get these different perspectives come together on a subject so until next time thanks again to our our panelists for for joining us and thank you for the attendees and i'll see you all again soon thank you